Good afternoon. So it's my great pleasure to welcome you um, to session three of today's conference. And that's a session that uh, combines a very interesting topic of firm behavior and also investors' behavior along uh, several dimensions. But let me first introduce our three speakers. So we have here Ivan Yotsov, who is an economist at the Bank of England. Uh, he was a PhD from the University of Warwick, and he's published on firm um, behavior, inflation uncertainty, but also topic related to economic history and also the political economy. Then we have our second speaker here, Benjamin Born, who's a professor of macroeconomics at the Frankfurt School of Finance and Management, and also um, affiliated to the Center of Central Banking. And he's also a research fellow at the CPI and CES IFO. Um, and also at the moment, he serves as a research director of the IFO's Institute Center for Macroeconomics and Surveys. Then we have our third speaker here, Stefano Ramelli, who is an assistant professor at the University of St. Gallen and also affiliated with the Swiss Finance Institute. And his research has focused on financial markets and on, in particular sustainable finance. So let us then start with the first paper by um, Ivan on the speed of firm response to inflation, which is joint work with also with Philip Bunn and uh, Nicholas Bloom, Paul Meisen, and Gregory Twaits. Um, so please, Ivan, you have the floor. Okay, great. Thanks everybody for being here and many thanks to the organizers for including the paper in this, in this conference. So I'm Ivan and this is a project called The Speed of Firm Response to Inflation, joint work with Nick Bloom, Phil Bunn, Paul Mizzen and Greg Twaits. Phil and I work at the Bank of England and therefore kind of the usual disclaimer applies. I don't think I need to say a lot to motivate the topic of inflation for this audience. Suffice to say we've been through a pretty significant inflation episode over the past few years and alongside this sharp increase in uh, headline inflation rates, short-term inflation expectations also increased quite a lot and that's true for both households and as well for firms. What we do in this paper is we focus on firms and we ask how do monthly CPI inflation releases affect firms' inflation perceptions and expectations? Are they attentive to this kind of aggregate news? And does that affect their own price uh, formation and expectations? And we think this uh, is important both for policymakers as well as to the broader academic community. A couple of figures to motivate this uh, a bit more. This figure is showing the trends in aggregate UK CPI inflation, that's the black dashed line, along with measures of firm price growth and expected price growth over the year ahead. That's in the kind of the blue and the, and the maroon lines. And what you see is that these are well correlated over the sample period. And now in 2024, firm price growth and expectations are definitely down from their peaks, but are still above pre-pandemic averages. Beyond these correlations, we also have some qualitative evidence that CPI inflation is an important factor in firms' this, this pricing decisions. So when asked, 60% of firms told us that they consider CPI to be one of the top three most important factors in their pricing decisions. This is based on some questions in 2023. And less than 10% said that it's not an important factor at all. And finally, alongside this increase in inflation over, over the past few years, we also know a significant increase in how much inflation is being covered in the media. And this is based on kind of a very, very basic index of inflation media chatter, if you will, which is just taking some keywords uh, at the daily frequency and looking at their counts in UK newspapers and scaling that by the total number of newspaper articles. And you see that's also quite well correlated with annual UK CPI inflation. So as I said, the main question of our project is to understand how do these CPI releases affect from perceptions and expectations, and we have three main findings. The first is that firms are aware of aggregate inflation changes, increases in CPI inflation leads to significant increases in CPI inflation perceptions, and this happens very rapidly. It happens within days and even hours following the release. Secondly, and perhaps even more importantly, there's a significant pass-through of CPI inflation changes to own price expectations of firms. So higher CPI inflation leads to higher own price expectations. 
And this effect is particularly significant over the 2022 to 24 period, but absent in the previous period with relatively low inflation. And furthermore, we find evidence of some kind of nonlinearity here, whereby positive changes in CPI inflation have a stronger effect on pr price expectations compared with negative changes in CPI inflation. And finally, in terms of thinking a bit more about the mechanisms, we find that these inflation releases also have an effect on a number of other firm level variables. So positive CPI inflation changes lead to higher near-term CPI inflation expectations, also lower expected volume growth and higher expected cost growth, and that's consistent with a kind of supply side view of the economy, at least over the past few years. Also positive CPI inflation changes lead to higher borrowing cost expectations among firms consistent with kind of an anticipated monetary policy response. And finally, we find evidence uh, that the media might be an important factor here. So firm own price expectations are also more responsive to CPI releases when inflation media coverage is elevated. There's been a lot of great literature on how firms and households respond to high frequency news, also on attention and inattention, how that varies over the business cycle, also on subjective models of the economy, including by, by people in this room, and we contribute to, to each of these literatures with our paper. So this is the plan. I'll tell you a bit about the data, the methodology, cover some of the key results, and then conclude. So in terms of the data, we use the decision maker panel survey. Jack already introduced it very well earlier this morning, so I'll, I'll be kind of brief uh, on, this, on this. So it's a, it's a survey we've had since 2016. We have about 2,500 responses each month, and we ask firms about recent developments and year ahead expectations for things like sales, prices, employment, investment. And we ask firms about a distribution of expectations rather than just point estimates. Now, there's a lot I can say about how we validate the survey, how we compare it to official firm accounts or aggregate statistics, national statistics. One thing I'll focus on, just because this is a conference about expectations in particular, is that firm, firms, firms have a pretty good idea about their annual price growth. So this is comparing expectations that firms have for their price growth a year ahead to their realizations a year after. And you see this really strong correlation suggesting that firms do have a pretty good sense uh, about how their prices are going to evolve. In addition to the questions on own price, own prices and own price expectations, since like May 2022, we've also asked firms about their current CPI inflation perceptions so really, what do you think is the current level of CPI inflation, as well as one year and three year ahead CPI inflation expectations. So on the left hand side, CPI perceptions, you see those follow really closely, annual CPI inflation. So firms are on average quite attentive to, to annual CPI inflation trends. And also on the right hand side, you see that one year and three year ahead expectations kind of peaked near the end of 2022 and since have converged to just under 3% for, for both measures. So that's been a lot about what's really on the left-hand side of the equation, kind of the dependent variables of firm prices, uh, firm perceptions and their expectations. But what about the right-hand side? And what are these, what are we, what is the treatment that we're, we're giving firms? And their main treatment is that we're giving is these changes in annual UK CPI inflation, which I've plotted here for, for each month. You can see between 2016 and 2020, they've been kind of small on average in magnitude as inflation was generally stable. Then there was a big shift to the upside as inflation was rising, and then more recently, they've sh shifted to the downside. It's important to clarify that these, these are not CPI news in the sense of outturns relative to forecasts or expectations. These are really the, the changes in the headline rate. So if CP inflation increased from seven to 9%, that's gonna be a two percentage point uh, change for that month. We also have data on CPI news and we do some additional uh, robustness tests with those as well, which I'll show you. So let me go on and describe to you the methodology. So the methodology is we use a, an event study to test the changes of CPI inflation on perception and expectations. And we focus to keep things uh, straightforward on a balanced two-day window around each release date. 
So each month, the Office for National Statistics in the UK publishes CPI data on a Wednesday during the month, and the DMP is collecting responses for two, week, two weeks every month. And usually, that release happens while the survey is collecting answers. So it becomes quite straightforward to test, uh, to look at the responses of firms on Monday and Tuesday before the release versus the responses on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday after the release. And what this specification is gonna allow us to do is kind of trace out the effect of the change in CPI inflation for each day of that event window, where we would expect kind of no effect before the release and effects, if any, on the days after the release. We can also saturate the, regre uh, the regression with month and industry, response window fixed effects, as well as firm fixed effects in some specifications. And what's quite powerful as well is that we can estimate this at the daily frequency, but we actually know when the firms are responding and when they're submitting their responses you know, to the second. So we can estimate this event study at the hourly frequency as well, which is what I'll show you uh, in just a minute. And furthermore, we, also have, uh, we can also estimate it as a more difference in differences specification where we just pull the, the effects kind of the average effect pre versus versus post. And that you can um, present in, for example, a, a regression table. Before I get to the results, one important point is, was raised earlier. Firms can submit their response to the DMP at any point over this two week period. So effectively, we're using the firms that respond on Monday and Tuesday is the control group, and the firms that respond on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday is kind of the treatment group. And we do a number of different checks to kind of convince ourselves that this is, this is a, a reasonable strategy, and here's one of them. So across a number of different firm characteristics like productivity, assets, sales, and, and employment, we don't find any significant differences across firms on average before versus, versus after the release. So let me go on to cover some of the, the main results now. So the first result is about CPI releases and CPI inflation perceptions. And so what is this, what is this figure showing you? So each dot here is, is actually a coefficient, which is showing you the effect of the change in CPI inflation on that hour of this event window. And the clusters are different days of a normal work week. So you have Monday, two clusters for Monday and Tuesday before the release, then CPI data come out on Wednesday at 7 a.m., and then you have some clusters on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Furthermore, the size of each coefficient corresponds to the average number of responses uh, received on, at, at that hour. And what, what, what it tells you is that kind of before the release, the coefficients are quite small and around zero on average, but immediately after the release, and I mean just within a few hours, you already see that the coefficients jump up and they remain quite high and, and really stable over the remainder of the event window. Now I haven't plotted confidence intervals for each of these coefficients because you know, with, with so many coefficients it will become a bit of a mess, but the red line, the, the, the dashed red line is plotting the kind of the pooled coefficient estimates for the pre versus post period. And that's saying that a one percentage point increase in CPI inflation leads to a 0.7 percentage point increase in CPI inflation perception. So about a 70% pass through, uh, which is happening very, very quickly. So firms, so to conclude, firms, are, firms seem to be quite attentive to these CPI inflation releases. Now the potentially more important finding is about CPI releases and firms' own price expectations. So this is showing you the exact same kind of specification, but now on the left-hand side, we have year ahead expected own price growth. And again, you see that before, before the release, the coefficients are kind of around zero on average, but they do jump up and they, uh, there is kind of this same positive effect, suggesting that about a 60% pass-through between CPI releases and expected on price growth. Of course, there is some more noise in, in this series, especially in, in days, uh, in, especially in hours with few releases, as you see on kind of the day of the release, but on average, the effect is, is quite significant across many specifications. Now, one thing as I wanna reemphasize again here is that this is, using, is not using CPI news, but is really using these, um, 
changes in CPI inflation each month. What, what we find if we look at CPI inflation news, well, we find no significant effect. So if we look at own price growth on CPI inflation news, constructed as CPI outturns minus some kind of forecast or expectations, then we find no effect on own price growth. So again, it's kind of uh, echoing the, the findings by, by Giacomo, you know, these firms are different agents than, than financial markets and financial agents. Uh, and so the responsiveness is, is quite different. I want to mention two further results before going on to cover some of the mechanisms that we find. The first result is that we find that these effects and the sensitivity to CPI releases is heterogeneous over time. We find that the responsiveness is significantly stronger over the recent period between 2022 and 2024, but not in the period between 2017 and 2021, when inflation on average was much, was much lower. And we also find evidence of a nonlinearity in these effects. Firm own price expectations are more responsive to positive inflation changes compared to decreases in headline inflation. We also do a number of additional robustness checks here, further testing the identification assumption, responsiveness to PPI changes, additional heterogeneity results, additional controls. Uh, I won't have time to cover these in, in much detail, but happy to discuss them afterwards as well. So let me go on to cover some of the, the mechanisms and how we, we think about these results on, on own price expectations. So the key question here is why might firms increase their own price expectations in response to higher aggregate inflation? And there are se several potential hypotheses. The first one is that when CPI inflation increases, firms might think that this would lead to higher CPI inflation further in the future, and therefore they will increase their own price expectations with, a, with the aim to kind of keep their relative prices stable. Furthermore, changes in CPI inflation could tell us something about how firms perceive uh, inflation, uh, what they perceive inflation to be driven by. So if there's a positive, if it's driven by positive demand shocks, then prices and output would move in the same direction. If it's a negative supply shock, prices and output would move in opposite directions. And we can test these alternative hypotheses using additional data we have in the DMP on CPI inflation expectations, unit cost growth, real sales growth expectations, and also expected interest rates on borrowing. And finally, we can test whether firms are more responsive to CPI outturns when media coverage of, the, of inflation is elevated, which would be consistent with this kind of attention or inattention mechanism. So what we find here is, well, so this is, table kind of summarizes uh, some of the key findings. So in the first two columns, we find pretty significant evidence uh, that when CPI inflation increases, one year ahead expected CPI also, uh, one year ahead expected CPI inflation is also increasing among firms. So there is this sense about firms trying to maintain their relative prices as a potential mechanism. Then in columns three to six, we test the effects on cost expectations and sales uh, real sales expectations, and we, have, and we find some evidence consistent with firms perceiving a more supply side view of the economy, so expected cost growth goes up and real sales expectations go down, although these, these results are not as robust and they are sensitive to the fixed effects and the type of specification. And finally, in column seven, for some of the months in this sample period, we also ask firms about their expected future borrowing costs, like what do they expect the interest rate to be on their own borrowing. And what we find is that positive CPI inflation changes lead to higher expected, expected borrowing costs in the future, which would be consistent with this kind of monetary policy response. We also have some results on uh, some additional data on wage expectations and medium term CPI inflation expectations, but we don't find any significant results there. Then onto the kind of the second mechanism, which is the interaction of CPI inflation changes with inflation media coverage. As I showed you in the beginning, this, this chart where inflation media coverage is really well correlated with UK CPI inflation over the, over the sample period. What we do is we take this, this index that we've constructed, and we look at how much inflation media coverage is there is in the days just before every CPI release. And then we kind of standardize that to have zero mean and unit standard deviation. 
So what this, what this table is showing you is that kind of on average, there is a positive and significant effect, for example, in column two, even when inflation media chatter is kind of at, at its average level. But a one standard deviation increase in inflation media coverage almost doubles this, uh, this responsiveness to CPI inflation changes. So that would be consistent with the media being an important channel through which firms learn about inflation uh, and that can affect their own price expectations as well. I think, let me conclude there. So what we do in this paper is we analyze how firms update their inflation perceptions and expectations to monthly CPI releases. We find that firms are quite attentive, at least over the recent period, and CPI perceptions update within hours of the latest release. Furthermore, firms update their own price expectations in response to CPI releases, and this effect was particularly strong over the recent period, and also stronger when CPI was increasing relative to, to decreasing. And finally, we find some additional um, evidence that firms tend to see this more, have a more supply side view of the economy. They tend to also expect higher short-term CPI inflation in response to CPI inflation changes. And we also find a potential role for the media um, in explaining these effects. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Ivan, and also for, for this nice uh, and interesting um, paper that explores really the timing of the, re the inflation releases and, and their impact, and also for keeping well in, in the time. So I, I would now open the floor for questions. Um, yes, please, I see one here. <coughs> thank you. So uh, Patrick Sabourin from the Bank of Canada. So two quick questions. Um, you seem to say that CPI inflation, the news, the media, uh, it impact their output price and price setting of year typically. So do you see uh, their own prices being uh, informative for future inflation? Because if they act upon the news and then they raise prices and so on, it could have consequences for, for next releases. Have you explored that? And also, just want to be sure I understand when you say that inflation matters for them. Is it because you already control for their own cost expectations or cost structure, their own demand, uh, overall demand and, and, and competitions, uh, level of competitions, all these drivers, and do you control for all of that? Because I just want to understand what, what else they're getting on top of what they know already to change their own prices. So maybe we collect a few, I had this. Thanks. Um, Tarun Ramadurai, Imperial College. Um, just two quick questions. The first is, it seemed like the pass-through was not only instantaneous but permanent. That is to say, they got to the place that they were going to get to and then they stayed at that level for several hours. If you pull that out a bit further, is there a term structure? Do they sort of adjust their expectations slowly over a period of time? I would be interested to see whether that's the instantaneous response and then there's some drift thereafter. Um, and then I guess my second question is, I understand that we're sort of treating these announcements as exogenous, but CPI is also the product of what firms are doing themselves. So I just wondered to what extent there's a fixed point problem in here and how you think about that. Yeah, Yuri. Yuri, Yuri uh, You focus on firm level uh, expectations. Do you have any measures for aggregate expectations? And if yes, what's the mapping from firms' expectations about their own conditions, own prices, to aggregate inflation expectations, for example? We have one more question here. Will with Van der Klau. Um, so to me, the results are a bit surprising um, in that I've seen uh, work, including some of my own, where when we look at price setting behavior, you know, they don't list inflation as being uh, very important, CPI inflation. It's more firms are looking at what other firms, what the competitors are doing, how they're setting their prices, where they're changing them and maybe what's coming down in the pipeline in terms of cost changes. So you think those are the channels that, you know, through which this effect is operating, that somehow they get surprised and say, okay, maybe inflation is higher than expected. That must mean we're not 
you know, we're not observing perfectly what the competitors are doing and what the cost, what's happening to costs down the line. So. Maybe we take one more question there at the back. Thanks. Uh, Lena Draga, Leibniz University, Hannover and Kiel Institute. Um, yeah, also relating to a previous point um, about this heterogeneity that you found with respect to price increases and price decreases, um, I found that quite curious and, and I think it might relate to some kind of downward price rigidity like we know for wages, but I was also wondering, I mean, if inflation goes down, some prices have to fall. Uh, whether you checked for heterogeneity there in terms of sectors or which specific prices were falling and then which specific firms were reacting to that or not. Thanks. So over to you. Okay, great. Let me, a, lo a lot of really good questions. I think there were two of them about kind of this fixed point problem about whether firm prices, you know, uh, CPI is affecting firms' expectations, and uh, and then CPI CPI is affecting firms' expectations, but of course, from prices uh, will then affect CPI to some extent. I mean, that's true. I, I think what what we try to do is just focus on this kind of very small um, event window. I mean, we're looking at really a period of five days, you know, between Monday and Friday, to try to isolate this effect. So it's it's that might be true, kind of I think on, on a longer time period. Um, uh, over a longer time period, but maybe less less uh, so over over kind of uh, just a few days or, or even hours. Um, but it's certainly an interesting point and uh, worth thinking about how how we can uh, say something something to that. Uh, furthermore, on a kind of additional cost and price controls, I mean we have some additional uh, kind of robustness checks where we control for from prices uh, from realized price growth over the past year uh, from price uncertainty, also measures of uh, uncertainty and stock, uh, stock price movements. And we show that kind of our main results are, are robust to that. I mean, we don't, you know, cost is also kind of, we can also control for costs. We have that only for a smaller sa sample period, um, but we can try that. But of course, cost expectations are one of the, of the outcome variables uh, that, we have, uh, that we have as well. Over a longer uh, over a longer time period, we have tried to do this as well. That's a, that's a good question about how it changes. One of the one of the issues is that usually um, the Friday after the release is the last day of the survey, uh, so then it closes. Then there's two week gap, and then and then the next survey re reopens. So so we have tried to kind of uh, do that kind of extended panel window. We do see find kind of the results stay. Uh, robust even if we extend to maybe 15 days uh, but it's, it's difficult to say uh, you know something about uh, maybe we can think about uh, how we can uh, something more about the term structure I mean we do have measures of kind of aggregate inflation expectations as well that's a good point I mean we have these kind of we, we do find that uh, CPI inflation changes affect firms this uh, near term aggregate inflation expectations uh, not so much their, their medium-term inflation expectations. On whether CPI uh, is an important factor, I mean, yes, one, one uh, response is that we asked this question in 2023 when inflation was, was really elevated, so we could re-ask the question again at some point, maybe during normal times CPI inflation was, um, uh, was less important, but certainly when, when CPI was elevated, firms were, uh, so, so perhaps that goes again with this kind of um, uh, time heterogeneity that it's really only when inflation is really high that firms are, have this uh, have, have the significant responsiveness uh, that we find um, on, on download price rigidity that could be one way to think about it I mean what we're capturing is expected price growth so it's it's not really whether prices are changing it's really about kind of the the rate of change which is which is slowing down um, we have done some some heterogeneity tests here for example, looking at um, goods versus services sectors, um, both seem to be responsive, maybe goods a, a little bit more uh, to these, maybe they have a slightly more flexible prices and that's why they're, they're a bit more responsive, but, um, but we don't find um, significant, uh, a lot of significant heterogeneity uh, across different firms. So again, both for goods and services, also for, for large and smaller firms, we do find a significant responsiveness to these CPI changes. 
Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, we would have time for one more question or one or two more questions, if there are any. Annalisa. Annalisa Ferrando, ECB. I have a question on your con um, on your on the surprises, on the inflation surprises. You are saying that firms are not. Uh, um, affected by this, but you say that inflation, there is a persistent on inflation, on the, on the say, perception of inflation. So what are the surprises for you? So, so when I say surprise, it's really about uh, the way, I mean, one thing is just the main treatment that we have is this change in CPI inflation. So it's not, whereas the, the surprise is more about what we look at is, you know, what is CPI inflation and, and what, is, uh, what is the, for example, Bloomberg medium forecast for, for inflation for this month. And you subtract those two and that's kind of this, this surprise measure of inflation. And we find that firms are not really responding to these, uh, these surprises. What they're much more uh, attentive to and much more responsive to is the, actually the, the, changes in, uh, the changes in aggregate inflation. Okay, thank you very much, Ivan. So then maybe we can turn to the next paper by Benjamin Born. Um, the impact on, of interest firms' investment sensitivity to interest uh, rates. And basically, it's a very nice paper exploring a hy hypothetical experiment in a survey framework. So you have the floor. Don't give, give everything away. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Thanks um, for putting our paper on the program and thanks for chairing this uh, great session. Um, first of all, I need to do a shout out to my co-authors, two fantastic uh, PhD students at the IFO Institute in Munich. And Manuel is on the market this year, so if you're hiring, have a look. He's, he's really great. Um, and then you also might wonder from the title whether this is a finance talk now. I'm at the business school, sensitivity to interest rates. But uh, rest assured, I'm a macroeconomist, and so let me motivate this in terms of macro. Um, so if we think of monetary policy uh, transmission, then policy can transmit through direct channels and indirect channels. And if you think of the representative agent New Keynesian model, then there it's all directly going into consumption. The central bank can basically play on the Euler equation, set the interest rate and consumption moves, right? But now with the heterogeneous agent New Keynesian models, the Hank literature has now stressed that, okay, this direct channel to consumption is not really uh, the dominating channel, it's rather indirect channels to consumption. So income effects play a large role. And one key channel in creating these indirect income effects is actually a direct channel through investment. So Adrian O'Clair and, and co-authors have really pinned that down. So the, the central bank sets the interest rate, affects investment, and that then hits consumption indirectly and the households. So, so that's nice. Um, the problem is that the empirical evidence on, on this interest sensitivity of investment is still mixed. And part of the problem is really that it's, it's hard to measure because we lack exogenous uh, variation in interest rates that firms face. Yeah, we have these identified monetary policy shocks, for example, but that's, of course, much broader than what actually matters uh, for the firm. So if we look at time series evidence uh, based on identified uh, policy shocks, Think of Cristiano, Eichenbaum, Evans, VARs, or then this huge literature following. There we see significant and persistent effects on aggregate investment. Um, but of course, the effects from the policy rate uh, change uh, to, to investment can be very heterogeneous across firms. Um, and, and there are general equilibrium effects that play a role and so on. So it's, it's a very imprecise measure of this direct interest rate uh, sensitivity. So then there's a recent, uh, there's some recent attempts using surveys. Uh, so what I'm aware of are qualitative surveys that suggest actually a small uh, direct interest rate uh, sensitivity of firms' investment. Um, but uh, the paper that I cite here, they, they look at the ex um, extensive margin. They have a qualitative survey. So I think this is only a first step. And that's really where, where we come in uh, with this paper. We want to actually have a quantitative measure of this elasticity of um, the interest rate on loan on a firm's investment uh, decision. And what we do is to, um, to get to this number, and, and that's what Ursel already uh, 
alluded to is that we use hypothetical vignettes. And if you don't know what that is, uh, I will be more precise in a second. But essentially, we give firms scenarios uh, for different decreases in the loan rate that they are facing, and then we ask them uh, by how much would you adjust, would you, and by how much would you adjust your uh, investment plans. Um, and, and we, we add to this hypothetical vignette then open uh, text questions to better understand why some firms might not adjust their investment uh, after a cut in the loan rate, for example. And you have seen examples of these open text uh, questions earlier today already. I think this is one of the new channels of survey research where we don't give them just different answer po um, possibilities, but really just let them talk. And, I was surprised how well that actually works because I usually click through these open text fields when I have to answer surveys, but our firms um, did not. Yeah? So what did we find? Just to give you a preview, um, so we find uh, a semi-elasticity after a one percentage point cut in the landing rate of six to seven yeah? percent. So investment over the fo following two years is increased by six to seven uh, percent. So that's um, a significant elasticity. I will link this to uh, other evidence in a moment. Um, what we also find is that there's a substantial share of non-adjusters. So a lot of firms do not adjust. Um, but for those firms that do adjust, we find a significant interest rate uh, intensive margin here. Yeah? So a lot of firms do not adjust, but those that do adjust by, by a lot. Um, the effect is particularly strong for financially constrained firms, and that might not be surprising to you, and larger firms with labor shortages. So that, that's kind of interesting in the situation we are in right now, where a lot of firms complain about labor shortages. Um, and if we look at the open text fields, we find a few narratives. Uh, and one um, narrative of non-adjustment is, is really uh, consistent with the pecking order theories that are out there in finance that firms prefer to use internal um, funds uh, first and only th afterwards go uh, external. So basically firms say we have enough internal funds, we don't need to look at the interest rate. And others just say we are not at the margin, our capital stock is fine, or um, the, so uh, I will be a bit more precise in a moment. And then the last thing that we do is because we wanted then to link this again to monetary policy, and the advantage of the survey in which we do this hypothetical vignette is that this survey was started basically after World War II. So we have long time series and firms are in this survey for a long time. So we can run local projections. We hit the firms with monetary policy shocks. And we look at the response of those firms that show a high sensitivity to interest rates in our hypothetical vignette versus those that don't. And we find this also maps into uh, stronger production responses in, in the local projections. So it really matters. This hypothetical scenario matters for re the real world and here monetary policy transmission. But let's, uh, let's be more precise on uh, how we do our survey experiment. So as I mentioned, we use a hypothetical scenario to elicit uh, firms, investment, uh, res the firms investment response to change in the loan rate. And of course, you might say, well, hypothetical scenarios can really learn something for, for the real world from these. Um, and of course, one has to be a bit uh, careful. So one thing that we really want to do is here, we, we want to cleanly identify the partial equilibrium effect from changes in the loan rate um, to, to the investment decision. And then we also need to be careful that this hypothetical scenario is still close to the decisions that managers typically take so that it's not too hypothetical for them so that we cannot learn anything from that. Yeah, I will show you our scenario on the next um, slide. So as I already mentioned, we add this question to a long running um, business survey. So we add this to the December 2023 wave of the IFO business survey. So the IFO business survey uh, is run by the IFO Institute in Munich. So it's a, um, a representative survey of uh, German firms, it's long running, um, it's an expectation survey, so we have many uh, questions on pr production expectations, price setting expectations, and so on. 
there's also now by now a large uh, bunch of evidence that it's not the intern answering these questions uh, in the survey. It's really the top management, so the CFO, the CEO, um, so on. So people in the know. Um, and overall, uh, we have more than 3,000 firms that actually answered uh, to our hypothetical survey. So we have enough in the cross-section to also do some randomization, um, as I will show you. So we add this uh, vignette to the survey, and before uh, firms answer our uh, vignette, we also ask them whether they have, they have plans for the next two years to, um, to invest. Yeah? So in December 2023, we asked them, do you plan to invest in 24 and in 25? Yeah? And depending on what they answer, we then tailor uh, the vignette. So it's an online automate, and it's an online survey, so we can automatically tailor the vignette to them. So how does it look? So this is the, the scenario we give them. So we, we tell them for the following questions, please imagine that the financing conditions improve for you and your competitors. Okay, so we wanted to keep that the same so that we really kill the general equilibrium effects here. For the next two years, the loan interest rates for all maturities, so here we want to keep it simple, there's no term structure uh, here. So for all maturities are X percentage points lower than currently expected. And the X we randomize across firms to also see whether size, the size of the cut matters. So some firms get a 50 basis point cut, others get a four percentage point cut. Um, assume that nothing else changes in terms of credit conditions, firm specific or macroeconomic conditions really to, to pin down the partial equilibrium effect. And if firms answered before that they plan to invest in 24 or 25, then they get this question here. To what extent would you adjust the amount of planned total investments for 24 and 25 as a result uh, in percent of your investment plan. Um, and if they said before said they did not plan to invest, then we just ask them, in this case, would you plan investments now after s seeing this scenario? Uh, yes, no, I don't know. Okay? So that's the, the scenario. So let's, let's look at the results. So this is basically uh, our main result here. So here on the x-axis, you see the different cuts in the lending rate uh, to firms. So 50 basis points, one percentage point, three and four. The blue dots are the adjustment in 24 that firms tell us. The uh, triangle, the orange triangle is adjustment in 25. The first thing um, to note is that 24 and 25 om look almost the same. So this seems like um, yeah, these projects take maybe more than one year, so firms do not really take 24 and 25 separately. They, they typically answer almost the same uh, to both. Yeah? So later, at some point, we also pool them. The other thing that's interesting, if we first look at, let's look at the one percentage point cut, and we see the average interest rate semi-elicity of investment here is six to seven percent, depending on um, whether we look at at the uh, 24 or 25 rate. Um, so that's basically one third of the general equilibrium effects that we find in the literature, for example, Ottonello et al. Yeah, so it's smaller than what these find, but here we really only have the partial equilibrium effect, but it's comparable to short run user cost elasticity estimates in the literature. What's also interesting is um, it's nonlinear. So it's not, the effect size is not scaling linearly in the size of the cut. Larger cuts have a, a smaller than linear um, elasticity, basically. Yeah? So that seems like there's a discrete choice to adjust your investment plans, but it does not scale with, with the size of the cut. Yeah? And now it's already mentioned it's pretty constant. So, so that's the overall effect, six to seven percent. But this is hiding, of course, the Firms that say we don't um, adjust at all. Um, so let's look at those firms that actually say we adjust their plans. Then, the, so the intensive margin adjustment is considerably larger, yeah, between 20 and 30 percent. So those firms that adjust adjust by quite a bit. Yeah? So um, 
so there uh, so so this is really interesting so of course then we can also look at the extensive margin and the decision to adjust at all and here we find a large difference between firms that before the hypothetical scenario told us we are we are investing yeah for those firms uh, the extensive margin is like 30 to to 40 or 50 percent for firms that said no we are not planning to invest most of them are also not convinced by this scenario so there's evidence for fixed capital adjustment costs uh, i would argue so what are the reasons behind uh, non-adjustment so here the um, the open uh, text question comes in that we use. So we ask those firms that say we don't uh, adjust investment plans, why would you not adjust the amount of planned total investment despite lower interest rates? I was skeptical that we would get many responses, but actually 77% of non-adjusters gave us a high quality explanation. Um, and then we hand code the answers into six broader areas that encompass 10 categories. But let me give you the gist. So there are three main narratives here. The first one, and that's what I've earlier called packing order, they just say, and that's 37% of them, they say, we have sufficient internal funds. So for example, one answer was, we um, have sufficient funds to finance investments uh, from liquidity. And if we look at other characteristics of these firms, so either survey answers that we have, but also balance sheet information, this correlates with high cash and equity holdings at the firm level. Uh, so that's consistent with that. Another 20% uh, said, basically, uh, there's low return to capital. We are at the optimal capital stock. So for example, higher investments that pl than planned would probably not result in significantly higher returns despite more favorable in interest rate. And those firms focus on replacement investments. If we look at other uh, variables, they have low R&D activity and so on. And then the, the last group, uh, these are high return to capital firms that say, well, in the end, the interest rate is not really that decisive. Uh, so for example, interest costs do not play a role in our investment decisions as the returns are sufficiently high. Uh, and if we look at the firms, they have also positive business expectations, they have high capacity utilization and so on. Uh, so those are narratives of non-adjustment and you see they're quite different um, uh, across firms. Um, just to understand, uh, and here I want to be quick uh, to have enough time for the macro implications, if we look at what drives then the decision to adjust uh, investment. And here, let me only show you the extensive margin adjustment. So we run a number of regressions, and what we find is, so the size of the firm is important. So larger firms are more likely not to adjust. So you could think of maybe managerial complexities play a role here. So that's the, the log employee number here. Um, with what is uh, kind of uh, intuitive is that firms that have a larger share of externally financed investment also are more responsive to, to the hypothetical scenario. And it's firms that um, before we run this scenario told us that they are financially constrained. So that's, that's also an, an important decision. So it's small financially constrained and externally financed firms that are more likely to adjust. Uh, so basically, how we think about this is that we shift the loan rate, and this decreases the external finance premium for those firms. Um, and firms that face a larger external finance premium ex ante are more likely to react. So in the, in the last three minutes, uh, let me now also talk about the macroeconomic relevance, because you might still say, well, these hypothetical scenarios, um, I don't really buy it. So the first thing is that we also, in the survey, ask firms, basically looking back, whether they adjusted their investment in response to the hiking cycle that we observed in 22 and 23. So basically, over that period, you all know that the ECB uh, hiked rates by uh, four and a half uh, percentage points. So we asked firms, what did you do? Um, what we find is that firms, on average, uh, reduce their investment by uh, eight and a half percent. Again, there is a large number of non-adjusters, and if we only look at firms that adjusted, they adjust by, by a lot. We can look at the correlations uh, across firms between 
the real world response to the hiking cycle and our hypothetical vignette. And these answers are highly correlated. So the firms are consistent uh, in their response, even though those two things are not really the same because with the hiking cycle, we had general equilibrium effects, all kinds of things going on. It was an increase in interest rates, not a cut, but still there, there is a large um, correlation between the two. So let me, let me come to the last thing uh, that I want to show you, and that's we can now use the panel dimension that we have. We can look at the whole existence of the euro area since 99. These firms stay in the sample for a long time, so if you look, a long time series. And we can now look at production changes of these firms in the survey, so actual outcomes. And we hit those firms by a monetary policy shock. Think of a Yaroshinsky, Karadi, uh, high frequency identified shock. And now we look at an impulse response and we separate those firms that in our hypothetical scenario responded in adjusting their investment and those that did not. And this is uh, the last uh, picture I want to show you. So the, the dashed orange line is firms that in December 2023 said we, we are adjusting uh, investment uh, to, to the hypothetical scenario, the blue line uh, firms that do not. And we see, and this is sig a significant difference. So firms that are more responsive in the vignette also are more responsive to monetary policy shocks uh, in, in the real world. Uh, so it matters. So let me conclude. So um, in, in this paper, let me, 20 seconds. <laughs> um, so how large is the is firm's investment sensitivity to interest rate? So we provide novel survey uh, evidence using a hypothetical vignette uh, by causally identifying firm's investment adjustment to lending rate changes. And the headline number um, maybe to take away is that a one percentage point reduction in lending rates leads to an upward adjustment in investment by six to 7%. The average response is driven by a substantial fraction of non-adjusters, um, mainly due to high cash buffers and lack of investment opportunities um, and a significant intensive uh, margin, conditional on adjusting. Um, the effects are particularly strong for financially constrained firms and for firms facing labor shortages. This I didn't show you here. And the last thing that I showed you is that the interest rate sensitivity is of first order importance for firms' uh, reaction to monetary policy. So thanks a lot. Sorry for taking No time. problem. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, any questions from the room? Um, otherwise, I also take from the tablet if you have online, but I have one here. Thank you. Hi, uh, Tarun Ramadurai. I'd just be interested. Um, the extent to which this, there's also some network effects in the set. It seems to be the case that you're sort of treating all of these firms as being firms that are, you know, basically at the same point in the supply chain, but they're all at different points in the supply chain. And what I'd be curious about is the extent to which the firms that are cash rich might be extending better terms of trade credit or something along those lines down the supply chain so you get different effects. Um, so they're not necessarily investing, but they're sort of turning into financial lenders because the uh, interest rate threshold has changed. I have one more question here at the back. Yeah, Jonas Dovan, University of Erlangen, Nürnberg. Nice paper, Benny. I had one question. Those firms that you called non-adjusters, are they equally distributed across sectors, industries, or can you find clusters of those companies in certain sectors? And I think you have also information about the age of the firms in the IFO survey. And can you identify that those non-adjusters are older firms, maybe in mature industries that do no longer rely <laughs> on external financing? Okay, I have one more question here. Philip Schnaufheil, Goethe in Frankfurt. I wonder about I know you want to focus on partial equilibrium effects, but whether you can speak to something like what firms would associate with a drop in, in lending rates, either by, for example, omitting the last sentence that you have in the hypothetical vignette, or maybe also post-vignette asking a few questions about firms' associations with a drop in rates. One question over here. Yeah, Chung Yang from uh, Federal Reserve. Uh, I have a question uh, about uh, and given the given your hypothetical question, uh, 
uh, it seems like it has a both level effects and a, a resolution of the uncertainty effects. Like, so you give us some specific kind of scenarios about the uh, future landing rates that kind of eliminate some uncertainties. And that might have some kind of effects on their hypothetical answers. Uh, is there a way that you can distinguish these level effects and the uncertainty uh, effects in, the, in, your, uh, in, your, uh, in your analysis? Yeah. I don't know if there's one more. Yeah. So did you look at the uh, difference uh, across firms? For instance, do you see m uh, firms related with sector which may be sens more sensitive to interest rate, in a sense, expectations of future than then how, how much it plays a role here as opposed to just like adjusting to their cost situation and so on? Okay, thank you. Maybe over to you. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for, for the questions. Um, the network effects, we haven't looked at this, but we can look at, um, so I don't know whether trade credit, we have any information, but at least we know the network structure, so we can see whether something is going on there. Um, so that's possible. Um, so Jonas, uh, so non-adjusters, um, so adjusters are kind of typically uh, firms, so, uh, so let's, how to phrase it. So there, there are some differences, of course. Um, I mean, we, we show that uh, there are some characteristics that drive non-adjustment. Um, it's not that there are certain sectors that, are, that kind of look very different, very different here. So we can throw in all kinds of controls and that doesn't matter uh, for our results. Um, and we, we run, uh, these regressions where we look at the extensive margin, for example, um, of adjustment and um, we see that it's more financial conditions and, and labor market issues on the demand side, um, not so much firm age, for example. But of course, these are correlated with, with other. Um, so for example, it might be older firms are at a point where they don't want to really adjust their capital stock anymore. They're, they're kind of saturated uh, firms that just uh, do their business model, but don't want to grow. Um, but we don't see any big uh, patterns there. Yeah. Um, so Philip, association with, with dropping rates, so we haven't asked that because we were wanted really to go for the partial equilibrium effect. Um, we could do run another, so we are thinking about running another wave um, with this and then we could ask them a few more things. Uh, so, so far we only had an open text question for those that did not adjust and want to understand why did they not adjust. But of course we could also ask them more about, okay, how do they understand uh, the scenario? Yeah. Um, so the, the resolution of uncertainty is also an interesting question. So we, I don't have a direct evidence for it, but what we see is, um, so we have measures of firm level uncertainty. Yeah? And that is not the, the key uh, driver of, of anything here. So uh, in the EFO survey, like Rudy Bachmann, for example, he works on, on some special questions with firm level uncertainty. So we looked at that. Um, so it does not seem to be that firms that beforehand were very uncertain are now the ones that, that respond um, strongly. Uh, but um, we, I don't have a, a direct uh, kind of measure of how much uncertainty is taken out by just the scenario that we give. Yeah. On the other hand, it's also not that we um, give them a 10 year whole path for the interest rate, right? It's only the two years. Yeah. Um, and then about the sectors. So we, we look at the sectoral evidence um, and what's kind of interesting there is that we also thought maybe construction would be an outlier because that's very interest rate uh, responsive typically. And, and we see some evidence, um, but again, it's, it's quite similar across sectors. So uh, it's not that this is all sorting across different, uh, certain industries and sectors, um, but it's more, there are firms in every sector that respond and others that do not. So there's more heterogeneity within the sectors, at least what we find here, um, that, that is important for the effects and the elasticities than the uh, across sector heterogeneity. Very good. Well, we are slightly early, but very good. Thank you very much for your replies and nice uh, presentation. And, and I'm happy to take more questions afterwards. <laughs>
Okay, and now we move from firms to US retail investors and from topics about investment and interest rates on to climate change. And uh, I give the floor to Stefano Ramelli um, on climate transition, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having me on the program and for the excellent uh, organization. Very happy to be here. And I will present you this paper titled Climate Transition Belief with my colleague uh, Marco Ceccarelli at VU uh, Amsterdam. So as you may know, in recent years, global investments in the energy transition has increased substantially. However, much more is, is needed. In fact, if we take the estimates of the International Energy Agency, we need to more than double the annual investments in green projects, in clean energy uh, projects, until 2030 to remain in the pathway towards net zero by 2050. So a usual question for financial economists is what drives green investments? What make an investors opt for a green investment option over a conventional one? And so far in the climate finance literature, we had looked at this question uh, mostly through the lens of the cost of capital. That is, we look at green investments for their non-pecuniary or risk edging properties. And one key insight from this literature, from an asset price pricing perspective, is that in equilibrium, green investment should have lower expected return than conventional one. Okay, so this makes perfectly sense. However, in this literature, we often take, make the simplifying assumption of homogeneity of beliefs, homogeneity of expectations about the belief uh, distribution of green firms and conventional firms. In other words, two investors may differ because of their, uh, non, uh, their environmental preferences, but we often assume that they have identical expectation about uh, cash flows or green firms versus conventional one. Of course, this simplifying assumption makes sense sometimes, but we know that it's unrealistic. And we argue it is particularly unrealistic in the context of the energy transition, uh, which is uh, a very highly uncertain event for which there are very disparate narratives. Let me provide you two examples of two narratives out there in the real world about the energy transition. On the one hand, we have the International Energy Agency that last year published uh, its outlook, a report, saying that the energy transition is underway and that it is unstoppable. And we will peak the fossil fuel demand already by the end of this decade. So this is a very optimistic view about the energy transition. On the other hand, we have other market actors, like the CEO of Saudi Aramco, who say that we should abandon the fantasy of phasing out uh, fossil fuels and calling the energy transition indeed a uh, fantasy. So these two narratives reflect very different vision of the future, very different mental model of the energy transition, uh, very different uh, climate transition beliefs, as we uh, call them. And the heterogeneity in these uh, transition beliefs is likely to play a huge role in explaining green investment behavior. That's the key message of uh, our paper in a nutshell. And we have two pieces of evidence supporting this message. We first have survey evidence and experimental evidence. With the survey, we show, we document considerable heterogeneity in climate transition belief and we find a strong positive correlation between transition optimism, green performance expectation, and the propensity to invest in a green fund. And we also find that transition beliefs are particularly important in explaining green investment decisions among investors without strong pro-environmental preferences. With the experimental survey, we provide causal evidence about this uh, relationship. So I will now show you a little bit about the survey. So the first baseline survey was run in November 2023, 20, uh, last year, in collaboration with uh, YouGov. And we focus on a sample of around 1,000 US uh, retail investors, meaning US citizens with experience in investing in common stocks, ETF, or mutual funds. And we set quotas to make our sample broadly representative of the US retail investor uh, population. We had 15 questions, so relatively short 
a survey divided in three uh, blocks of questions. The first block is about climate concern and environmental preferences. Then we have a block of question about climate transition belief. And finally, some question about green investment expectation and preferences. Let me tell you a little bit about the key question in these three blocks. So in the first block, we borrow question from other climate related surveys. For instance, the Yale, um, uh, the survey by the Yale program on climate change communication. We have a question about pro-environmental preferences. So we ask, to what extent do you feel a personal responsibility to try to mitigate climate change from one to 10? And we ask some question about climate change worry. So to what extent are you worried about uh, climate change? Again, these are questions used uh, in other uh, papers. Next, we were interested in asking, eliciting respondents' uh, long-term expectations about the energy transition. So how can we do that? I mean, that's very complicated. The approach we propose is to proxy uh, climate transition belief through subjective expectations on a very specific dimension. The share of UL, US, electricity, uh, US electricity capacity coming from renewables, meaning solar, wind, and hydro. So why we decided to for this approach? We think this approach has two uh, key advantages. The first is an, is an advantage in terms of relevance because expanding the share of renewables in the electricity mix is considered the single most important step to make the energy transition happen. So it's very important to expand renewables in the electricity mix. And second, it allows us to capture expectation about the energy transition, very complex phenomenon, through relatively simple and understandable uh, questions. So that's the question we ask uh, to a proxy for climate transition belief. So we first inform respondents that according to official statistics in 2022, the share of uh, US electricity coming from renewables was around 22%, up from 10% in 2010. And then we ask, how much do you expect the share of US electricity generation from renewables to be in 2030? 2040 and 2050. And we also have alternative uh, questions, uh, but uh, all around the same approach. So we have a question that is more qualitative in nature, another one that is more probabilistic. So let's move to the third block of uh, question where we are interested in understanding green investment preferences. So here we, re we present our respondents with two investment options. Uh, uh, US, uh, uh, US equity uh, ETF, a very standard um, uh, ETF product investing in the, in the US uh, uh, market and its low carbon counterparts. So for the, for the low carbon uh, investment option, we decided to show uh, some information from Morningstar, particularly this low carbon designation label that you can see here, this green label. And the reason why we decided to do that is because previous research that we conducted showed that this type of information is effective in shifting uh, capital flows. So investors seems to be reactive to this information. So we decided to include this, uh, this type of uh, um, climate related information. And we randomized the low carbon green funds as either fund A or fund B to avoid any order effect in the responses. And we ask our respondents about their green um, expected returns. So we ask, how do you expect the return of fund A or fund B to be over the next uh, uh, 10 years? So these are relatively return expectation question from one to five. We also ask about their expected green risk. And finally, we ask them to make an hypothetical investment choice of 10 uh, 10,000 US dollars, either in fund A or fund B, meaning either in the green funds or in the conventional uh, fund. And here we decided to leave this question, this investment question, uh, hypothetical because we wanted our respondents to focus on the long term, a 10 years investment horizon. So it's very hard to uh, incentivize with a lottery such an investment. So, so let me provide you some uh, descriptive uh, information about climate transition belief. So here, this is a distribution of climate transition belief at 2050 horizons. Uh, 
meaning this is the expected share of renewables in the electricity mix at 2050 horizon, and we find that on average, our respondents expect 59% of their electricity to come from renewables in 2050. And in general, we observe a large degree of heterogeneity in these responses, as we may have expected. So what does this 59% uh, means, you may argue. So let's compare it to the official um, uh, forecast by the, international, the uh, US Energy Information Administration. The official forecast forecast around 54% of electricity generation cap capacity coming from renewables by 2050. So does that mean that our respondent casting more optimistic forecasts are necessarily wrong? Not necessarily, because if we look at the official forecast cast in 2012, they were projecting the share of uh, uh, renewables in the electricity mix to be 16% by 2035, a level that we then reach already in 2016, so far uh, uh, before uh, the, the 2035. So it's hard to, to say who is wrong and who is right. We are a bit agnostic about uh, that. Importantly, another uh, uh, interesting descriptive evidence is that we find that transition beliefs are very different from environmental preferences. So as you can see, most of our respondents lie in this diagonal. So they rank either above or below the average on both in transition uh, beliefs and uh, environmental preferences. But we have around 30% of our respondents who rank either low or below one of the two dimensions and not the other. So uh, transition beliefs and environmental preferences are two different dimensions of uh, uh, human thinking. So who are the uh, transition optimists in our um, uh, survey? We find that younger people, women, Democrats versus Republican are more optimistic about the energy transition and also respondent living in area uh, with a higher share of renewables in their electricity production. However, even when we account for all these observable characteristics in the same regression, we can explain only a tiny fraction of climate transition beliefs, which hence are largely idiosyncratic, and hence we argue uh, even more interesting to, uh, to study. In particular, we are interested in studying how they relate with investment preferences. So here, in this regard, we regress green expected return on climate transition belief here at 2050 horizon. And we find that climate transition optimism is associated with significantly higher green return expectation. And this result is economically important. So a one standard deviation, higher climate transition beliefs can explain around one third of one standard deviation of green return expectation. So belief seems to, transition belief seems to play an important role in driving the heterogeneity in green return expectation. And we also find that more climate transition optimists not only expect the green fund to deliver higher return, but also to have lower risk. So we interpret this result as evidence that they perceive the transition not to be adequately priced in by financial markets. Okay? But we recognize that this may also be the results of equilibrium neglects. So next, we find that climate transition optimism is not only associated with higher green expected return, but also a, a higher propensity to opt for the green funds over the conventional funds. So in fact, one standard deviation higher climate transition beliefs can explain uh, one quarter of the unconditional probability of investing in the green funds. And this effect is largely mediated by green return uh, and risk expectations. So, so far, all these results that I show you are simply based on a, a simple survey. We wanted to provide some more causal evidence of the role of beliefs on uh, green return uh, expectation and preferences. Hence, we run an experiment, an information, information provision uh, experiment, uh, whose goal is to provide an exogenous variation in climate transition beliefs, and then allowing us to study the effect, the treatment effects on a green return expectation and investment preferences. 
So we run uh, an experiment with the same survey structures. Actually, we run two experiments, one in January and one in August uh, this year, with the same question as in the baseline survey and with around 4,000 retail investors, US retail investors, new subjects. So this, we excluded uh, participants in the first uh, wave. And we pre-register our experiments. So what is our information treatment? Information treatment is uh, one of two randomized short animated video about the energy transition. Both offering truthful information, but opposing views about the, the future trajectory of the energy transition. So in the pessimist treatment, we show a video, for instance, emphasizing that we need to double the uh, electricity grid to allow for the energy transition, and that investments in fossil fuel increase over the last few years, and that still 80% of global energy consumption still comes from fossil fuels. So a very pessimistic view about the energy transition. In the optimistic treatment, we show a similar short animated video emphasizing the progress uh, on, in the energy transition in recent years. For instance, we inform our respondent that more than 80% of the new uh, addition in the electricity capacity last year already came from renewables. And we also emphasize, for instance, the tenfold decrease in the cost of solar uh, energy over the last 10 years. So very optimistic views about the energy transition. I'm sorry, I don't have time to show you the two videos right now. I will certainly cause some technical problems, so I will not do it, but uh, you can find the link uh, on the paper. So they are both on uh, uh, YouTube. So let's come to the results. So the first uh, stage treatment effect, the first stage treatment effect, we are interested in studying the treatment, the effect of our treatment on climate transition belief. And we find that in the optimist uh, treatment, our responders are significantly more transition optimist than in, in the uh, pessimist treatment. In fact, we see around a uh, five uh, percentage point difference in the expected share of renewables at 2050 horizon. So five percentage point is economically important, but also not unreasonable. So meaning that the two videos are quite balanced in terms of uh, uh, information. And these first stage treatment effect confirm the success of our treatment in shifting uh, beliefs in the desired direction. In the second stage treatment effect, we are interested in uh, studying the effect of our treatment on green return uh, expectation. And we find that respondent in the optimist treatment are more optimistic about the return of the green fund relative to the conventional one. And in fact, they expect the green fund also to have lower risk than the conventional one. Finally, the third stage treatment effect, we are interested in uh, studying whether our treatment shifts in preferences for green investments. So here we find that respondent in the optimist treatment are around 1.6 percentage point more likely to choose the green funds over the conventional one. Now this difference is not statistically significant, but here I want to emphasize that this measure of green investment only reflect a binary choice. So we gave, we gave the respondent the opportunity to pick just the green fund or the conventional one. So it's not very uh, suited to, to study uh, the treatment effect on the extensive margin the intensive margin of uh, green investments. For this reason, we run a new identical pre-registered experiments more recently in August uh, uh, this year with 1,000 additional uh, respondents randomly allocated uh, between the optimistic and the pessimistic treatment. And uh, first, we successfully replicated all the other results. And finally, we found that respondent in the optimistic treatment uh, allocate eight, uh, uh, allocate, uh, so there is an increase in, of 8% in green investments relative to green investment in the pessimistic uh, uh, treatment. And in fact, we found we estimate a behavioral el elasticity of around 0.5, meaning for any additional one percentage point increase in climate transition belief, we see a change in green investment of around 0.5%. 
So these results confirm that transition belief seems to play a very important role in driving uh, green investments. So to conclude, what are the key takeaways of our study? We were interested to understand which long-term equilibrium do investors env envision about the energy transition and how this expected future translates in their investment decision uh, today. We find significant heterogeneity in investor transition beliefs with important effect on their expected green return and green investment preferences. Who is right, who is wrong, that we don't know, so we are agnostic about that. Uh, the future will tell, but who will be right exposed also depend on green investment decision today. So we may have uh, some self-fulfilling uh, properties of uh, transition belief uh, uh, that, that are important to take into account. So the key message is important to track uh, climate transition belief also for uh, central bankers and also to account for the effect of climate change on financial stability, for instance. Thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Stefano. So um, let's turn to the Q&A. Any questions from the floor? Jeff? Uh, hi, thank you uh, very much. Uh, Jeff Kelly, ECB. Um, yeah, I found this very, very interesting. Um, so I have two questions. The first is uh, one of the points you emphasized was that you have this dif differentiation between beliefs and preferences. Exactly. And I wondered if it's interesting or if you've looked at it in terms of whether any of the effects on, on beliefs from your, 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 um, uh, your experiment differ depending on uh, people's preferences about climate change. So if people have very strong preferences uh, that they're, you know, regarding climate change, but they may have pessimistic versus more optimistic beliefs. That was the first question. The second question is more technical. So if I understand correctly, the experiment as well, you don't really have a placebo. You don't have a non-treatment or a no information in your experiment. And I wondered how you think about that, that result as well. Any more questions? Maybe, maybe I can add one. So um, I think it's very interesting. I was wondering, um, do you have any policy conclusions for policymakers or central banks on how to communicate at CATE about the energy transition? I mean, anything that you could draw from, from, from your analysis? So also online, we have no question. Anyone else wants to raise a question? OK, I can ask a very, please. A very quick one. <laughs> So when you're when you're trying to look at the different um, descriptives which might describe um, transition beliefs, I was wondering whether you looked at, for example, whether they lived in an area with hurricanes or floods, or, or any kind of those kind of natural disasters. Can I? Yes, can I start? Okay, I'll start from the, the last the last question. That's a very good question. Uh, so so far uh, we have not. Um, explore that dimension, but we can definitely do it. I mean, so far we use, because we had the zip code of respondents, and so far we just uh, look, uh, look at the shares of uh, renewables in that area using data from the Environmental Protection Agency, <coughs> but we can also look at uh, exposure to climate physical risk. That's a very interesting question. On uh, the implication for central bankers, I think the main implication is that so I see two main uh, uh, implications coming out from, uh, from our studies. The first is that it's important to track uh, climate transition belief in the economy. So just to study, so uh, as you do it already for inflation expectation, I don't see why we should not also monitor expectation about the energy transition, which is likely to play a very important role, especially in the next few crucial years where we really need to invest heavily in the energy transition. The second potential implication is not that we should promote or push for excessively over-optimistic narrative of the energy transition. I don't think that is what we need to do, uh, but we probably need to resist an uh, excessively pessimistic view about the energy transition. Because for instance, fossil fuel companies have all the advantage in sharing a very pessimistic view of the energy transition to attract external capital. So that uh, something that we need to, to resist and, of course, 
Another important implication is to have credible uh, climate policy commitment in the long run that they can forward guide expectation of investors at this low carbon, long term equilibrium. But of course, that it's easier say than than done. It's very complicated, but that's the most important. Uh, coming to the first uh, two uh, questions, that's very, uh, very good questions about the placebo. So in the experiments, uh, in the first experiments, we included a no treatment uh, group. So we have a placebo group, but we intended that mostly as uh, a second wave of the baseline survey. So because the, we run the first, the first, uh, the very first survey right before the COP28 and the experiments right after the end of the COP28. So we were interested in understanding whether in the meantime climate transition belief changed. And we don't see any difference between and after the COP28. The goal was not to compare active treatment group with no treatment group, because obviously having a video changed many things. So that's why it's important, uh, was important for us to have two active uh, treatment groups, meaning two uh, short uh, videos and uh, you said about you also ask about the heterogeneity in the treatment effects based on environmental preferences so in the survey we clearly see a very strong uh, role of uh, uh, pro-environmental preferences so a belief seems to be much more important among people without pro-environmental preferences why because highly pro-environmental investors pick the green funds and no matter what, no matter what are their transition beliefs. So beliefs are more important among uh, uh, investors without strong pro-environmental preferences. In the experiment, is a little bit more complicated, so we don't have a super clear evidence of this heterogeneity. And it's complicated for a very simple reason, because we have different layers of treatment effect. So the first treatment effect is on beliefs, and the second uh, stage treatment effect is uh, on expected return through changed beliefs. So we see that um, pro, highly pro-environmental investors, they may react more or less in terms of, uh, they may update more or less their uh, transition beliefs, and then they may behave, respond differently to this changed belief in the second stage uh, treatment effect. So we have some evidence that highly pro-environmental investors react a little bit less to their changed beliefs. But it's a bit more complicated to show than in the survey. Exactly. Very good, thanks a lot. That brings us to the end of session three. So, um, so there will be a coffee break now until 3.45. Um, but you know, before that, let me basically please join me in thanking all the presenters for their excellent presentations and the nice discussion. Thank you.